country and joining us via video Skype in the second hour of this Tuesday, the 13th day of September 2011. Transmission, Alfred Adask is joining us in the second hour. We're going to have open phones in the first and third hour and also when Alfred joins us coming up. You know, what's happening here is more and more, myself, the listeners, all of us, even though we're awake, we're just becoming acclimated and conditioned. Uh, Ten years ago, if something like Fast and Furious happened and we caught the government, I would be much more upset about it on air and I'd probably be talking about it uh, at nauseum. But now, things of the magnitude of Fast and Furious with the government shipping guns into Illinois, Indiana, uh, Florida, California, Texas, to drug gangs to kill their competition, shipping guns into Honduras, into Mexico to kill their competition and to destabilize those areas and then demonize the Second Amendment, that would be a bigger issue. There have been articles in the Chicago Tribune, articles in the El Paso Times in the last month. Of course, we had articles three months ago. Actually broke it at Infowars.com, Paul Watson did, and because a listener sent us, hey, have you seen these federal filings where uh, the federal government is admitting that the CIA was allowing cocaine to be shipped into the United States by the Sinaloa drug gang, one of the biggest cartels on the border, in exchange for going after their competition and laundering their money through certain U.S. banks. And it just comes out in mainstream news, and we mention it, we talk about it, then we move on. We move on. It has the desired psychological warfare effect on us. In a way, I'm weak-minded. Compared to a lot of people, we're strong, but we're, we're still very weak. We're all human. The globalists understand what makes us tick and how to punch those buttons. They have ABC News, BBC, Fox News, Reuters, video. I mean, I, I, I could play more than 20 different newscasts here, and I, and I have played most of them. Where they go, yeah, our, our troops grow the opium, give them the fertilizer, and we, they load it on trucks and it just disappears. It's, it's for America. If you're not for growing the opium, you're with Al-Qaeda. They just do this stuff out in the open now. And so instead of just denying this stuff like they do 15 years ago, now they just go, yeah, we're doing it. Now let's move on. Hey, you're getting all the bombers into the U.S. and onto the airplanes and and onto Fort Hood and and and, and the government's been caught running all these operations. And you're putting Al Qaeda into Libya, and they go, "So what? We're taking your rights because of Al Qaeda." I've got more news on that. They, they, it's in uh, what Reuters that yeah, okay, Al Qaeda's taken over Libya, and NATO warns they have to deal with them now. <laughs> you, you put Al Qaeda in to knock out Gaddafi. And then you say, oh, my gosh, now we got to have a war with Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda's got Libya. That's in Reuters today. I mean, the only reason the establishment is doing this is because they know the general public. I was listening to Bloomberg Radio this morning, just about an hour ago, driving into the office, and I heard the host say, oh, I don't think the implosion of Europe's going to hurt the U.S. too much. Most Americans don't have a passport, and most of those people can't even find Europe on a map. And all the hosts were cackling and laughing. Ah, Americans are so stupid. It's so funny. It was like Woody Woodpecker. I mean, it's real funny that the government ships the smack. And the cocaine in here, the heroin, all of it. And then your kids use it and they put, put you in their prisons, owned and run by the drug cartels. Oh, yeah. Do a study of it. I've looked it up. Most of the big private uh, bank run private prisons are narcotics funded. <laughs> I mean, they put you in a prison owned by the drug kingpin. All right. We have got a big broadcast lined up for you today on this Tuesday edition, the 13th of September. 2011. Can you believe 2011 is getting long in the tooth? And I'll be sitting here, and it'll feel like five minutes from now going, we're approaching December 2012, when the government and the media and so many other institutions have been uh, joining in on the fear-mongering that the world is going to end. I am not one of those voices, but you watch. In 2013, 
if I'm still here, that certainly is is uh, in question. <laughs> uh, I believe the world will still be here, but none of us know if we'll individually be here. That's certainly in the cards that any of us uh, could die in a car wreck, you name it, struck by a bolt of lightning, whatever the case may be, that after the 2012 thing doesn't happen, that there will be national media that will attack yours truly and say that I said 2012 would be the end of the world. You watch. And people will edit together what I've said over the years to make it sound like that. I know that because it's been done before. All right. Uh, it is Tuesday, ladies and gentlemen, and we have Super Patriot demonized by 60 Minutes and others, the always uh, informative and uh, alternative uh, to tyranny, Alfred Adask. He will be joining us coming up in T-minus 51 minutes from now. Uh, these are the type of news headlines I have today. It's been confirmed that Merck paid off the California legislature to pass an attempted move to make uh, Gardasil mandatory. That itself is a hoax. It's not mandatory. They just say it is. Uh, but Business Wire has the headline, uh, SaneVax, Inc. reports human papillomavirus, HPV, contamination in Gardasil to FDA request public safety investigation. And I guess they mean that the RNA of the virus has gotten into the DNA. So we're going to be uh, going over this report, and I want to get Mike Adams' take on this uh, as well. But we've got some important Gardasil news coming up because now they're trying to run their regular hoax that it's the law all girls in America have to take it, and it's the law that all boys have to take it, and it's the law that all Mexican girls have to take it. Uh, there is no law in Mexico. You've got to take vaccines. I've looked it up. And there's no law in the United States. You have to take vaccine. But they keep hammering that lie. Every August before school starts, you can tune into national radio, national TV, local radio. It's in all the newscasts, a little PR announcement. Most of it's paid. That's a big, dirty secret in talk radio. A lot of local news is actually paid product placement, propaganda placement, that it's the law. You've got to be vaccinated for school. Go to your local clinic. They're having a mass vaccination today at Zilker Park. I remember hearing that a month ago. Uh, or at these uh, area sports uh, stadiums. It's the law. Don't get arrested. A total criminal hoax. And if you'll just go check it out for yourself and discover that I'm not lying to you and there's no law you have to take a vaccine and go into the school and let the school nurse lie to you first and say it is the law, Mrs. Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Johnson, Mr. Mr. Brown, uh, Mr. whatever the case is. Let them lie to you and then say, A, you've got a waiver. You've got to give me by law in that um, filing cabinet. And B, there is no law. I've got to even fill that out. You just try to trick me if I wake up to another level of lies and get me to induce myself into a contract filed with the health department saying basically I'm a bad parent and there's a list of unvaccinated people. It is your policy under the state health department that it's the policy that government would like you to have a shot. But what you do is, if I'm ignorant, you will kick my child out of school under policy, then invoke truancy laws and try to take my child from me. And the hardcore criminal cult member behind that desk, the principal or that, or that nurse, you will have that hardcore vicious criminal caught. And you will have them in your sights and you will know how evil they are. And you will experience the culture of evil. Let me tell you how evil works. They find jellyfish creatures who will follow whatever orders they're given. And that's how tyranny works. That's how cops arrest people for things that aren't against the law every day in this country. That's how judges instruct juries to convict people of things that aren't illegal and put it under some, some other law. That's how tyranny takes over a society. Now, I have a video clip I'm going to play later when Alfred Adask is on with us of a man peacefully on the street outside of the Ground Zero events. They had streets shut down and a 9-11 truther got through. And I've seen countless reports from our sources and more videos are surfacing 
of people actually being arrested and then beat up. I covered it on the nightly news last night. This individual, I confirmed, was not roughed up. It was others that were arrested who were roughed up, and we're working on getting in contact with them. But Luke witnessed people being arrested uh, for simply wearing 9-11 shirts and speaking out. He witnessed people being turned back for investigating 9-11 or 9-11 is an inside job or we are change shirts, not from ground zero itself, but from upwards of 10 blocks away. They had checkpoints everywhere. They shut the city down to one lane of traffic on all the major streets to keep people out so there couldn't be 9-11 truthers converging and killing the hoax there. They wouldn't allow the firefighters, the police, the medical workers who survived, and many of which were injured, many of which are in wheelchairs, into the event. Because in past years, and we've shown the video, uh, survivors and others will speak out and say, it's an inside job, Giuliani, you know it is. It's never made it on national TV, but it's made it when they're going up and down into the pit uh, there in the bleacher seating, and the system is very, very scared. There have been other 9-11 events in the lead-up last week and in other cities where people did jump on stage and say 9-11 is an inside job. So the system is desperate. They can't have their, their, their hoax fully implode because they need to stage more now. And they're moving to their next phase to blame it on Tea Party, conservatives, libertarians, and gun owners. They're, they're now rolling out the PR, just like I saw a PR rollout on bin Laden. And I said, they're going to blow up the World Trade Center and blame it on bin Laden. I mean, I said that a year before. I said it six months before, but we have the tape of me saying it two months before when I said, call the White House. Don't let them blow up the World Trade Center and blame it on Osama bin Laden, their CIA asset. Because I saw the preconditioning, the rollout. There is now a total and complete rollout taking place as we speak to blame it on domestic groups. And so I am begging all of you out there to realize that this is make it or break it to get this information out. But uh, I've now seen several videos. In fact, I forgot to give them to the crew. Um, dude's got them. Or they've, it's now rolled off the front page of Infowars.com. Uh, it's now in the featured news archive. Uh, they're on Infowars.com, um, several of those videos. Uh, but the first one is really crisp, clean video. And I'd like to interview the person who was uh, arrested. And it's got him just saying, we need to investigate this. It was a crime scene. I've got flyers here. And there's other street people talking. That's fine. A guy runs up and screams, says, you're not wanted here. And so uh, the police then arrest him, drag him off, put him in handcuffs, and put him in the car. And I've got incredible reports, and I'm told the video is being uploaded, uh, that other people were arrested as well, and some of them, you know, slammed into the uh, cars, roughed up by police. Wouldn't be the first time I've been roughed up by New York police. Uh, and, of course, I've also been roughed up by the Austin jail guards for no reason when I was arrested for demonstrating. It's just part of the tyranny. Cowardly people get a job so they can slam your head into a wall and feel powerful. Only the ultimate coward would want to rough somebody up who... Uh, had done nothing wrong except exercise the First Amendment and, and, and slam your head into things. Now, I could see if you arrested somebody who had three dead kids in a trunk in their house, uh, you'd want to uh, beat the pulp out of them. But you wouldn't do that because you want to make sure they got a nice, fair trial before they got the lethal injection. But cops getting off on beating up peaceful demonstrators. It's wrong. It is the essence of evil, the essence of tyranny, the essence of bullying, the essence of anti-freedom, the anti-America. So that's coming up with Alfred Adaska as well. But, but I tell you, when I first saw this footage yesterday, Luke had told me about it. And I thought, uh, on and off here, he told me a few stories. Uh, and, and then I thought when we saw this video posted that that was the case he was talking about. But no, there's, there's a whole bunch of these and all over the city, uh, no, you're wearing a 911 shirt, get, go back. But this isn't a controlled area. I'm, I'm trying to get into lower Manhattan. No. And see, next, oh, it's on your file, you're a 911 truther. You can't get on an airplane. You can't get a job. The essence of tyranny, again, is about labeling people and restricting their rights. And what has Rahm Emanuel and others said? And now we've got evidence it's begun uh, by stealth. 
Well, we know what happened to vets. Uh, Clinton did it to uh, 80-something thousand right before he left office. Back in 2000, early 2001. That was 2000. Uh, it, was, it was in World Net Daily, other places reported on it. You, uh, old vets go try to buy guns. No criminal record. Sorry, can't buy guns anymore. We went into your psychology file and you, you collapsed in Korea. Well, yeah, it was heat exhaustion. Well, it doesn't matter. Well, we're saying that's PTSD. And that's if you can even get an answer. Well, now it's just we, we don't like your politics. You don't get to have a Second Amendment. No judge, no jury, no charges. You're in the anti-terror database. And, yeah, here's some of the footage uh, going out uh, to break. And, and we'll give you the YouTube channel where you can watch the whole whole thing as well. Give you their handle. Uh, but uh, they, they drag him off, and they got the footage of him going in the squad car. But the guy yelling at him with pleasure. Now, he's allowed to have his speech and hand out literature. It's a pro-official story. It's just not those truthers. Take them away. All right, I've already thrown out a smattering of important news, but I want to... Take your phone calls uh, and get into a ton of other news ahead of a guest joining us. The toll-free number is 800-259-9231. And I want to give first-time callers a chance to call in, at least in the first and second hour. It'll be wide open phones in the third hour today. 800-259-9231. Here is what's coming up in the third hour today. The federal government has filed in Chicago... Uh, in the big court case that's gotten an attention in the Chicago Tribune and El Paso Times, uh, where it is admitted uh, that the CIA and ATF gave authorization to the Sinaloa drug gang over five years to ship huge amounts, tons after tons of pure cocaine into the United States, and they were shipping guns to them. Now, this has always been going on, but... the this guy got busted by the Mexican government and then extradited to the United States. And he claimed all of this, and it began to come out in documents a few months ago. Now new documents in a motion filed Friday, September 9th, U.S. prosecutors did invoke national security and are saying, yes, it's true, but we still want to send him to prison, basically. This is big news. I'll be covering it with a special report tonight, 7 o'clock InfoWars Nightly News at InfoWarsNews.com and, of course, PrisonPlanet.tv. But I'm going to get more into this in the third hour today. See, Fast and Furious is not just guns into Mexico. It's guns into Honduras. It's guns into Nicaragua, El Salvador. It is guns into all of Latin America where cocaine is grown and where other drugs are imported and smuggled into the U.S., it is guns to gangs. As I told you, people were asking me, how do you know it was being shipped into Chicago? We didn't see any articles about that. It was in the federal filings months ago. Now it was in mainstream news last week. Guns into Indiana, into Chicago. All these reporters have got to do is go read. And, and I'll just quickly at night when I've got some time pull up the latest filings uh, that are posted on these different narco news sites uh, with writers like Bill Conroy. Well, I want to get on the show, by the way. Uh, you know, who are going over this. Uh, all this stuff is is posted in public view on the federal websites and then reposted at the Narcosphere and other other great websites out there. Th this is public. You know, people always say, well, the government couldn't get away with drug dealing. They would get caught. They do get caught. I mean, it, it came out in congressional hearings in the 70s that they, in thousands of dead troops, showed um, pure heroin into... In, into the inside of their bodies and would, would unzip them uh, once they got here and, and take the goodies out. I mean, it's on record in the 1997 hearings in Congress that they admitted that, yeah, for a decade, the government shipped cocaine into L.A., gave the crack cocaine uh, formula to the crack dealers. I mean, I've interviewed Ricky Ross. He was making $30 million a day some days. He was just a regional dealer for the CIA. Gary Webb found out about it, wrote about it, won a Pulitzer Prize. They just went and killed him. Shot him twice in the back of the head. And the police came out and said, oh, that's normal. Even though Gary said people are breaking in my house, he had to move because of it. He caught guys, special forces types, jumping off the roof and climbing down water drains. And he described them like cats.
You pull out in their special forces types <laughs> coming down your deal that have broken in your house. You warn everybody, hey, I'm getting threats. They kill you. And it's like, oh, no, nothing happened to him. This is how this stuff works. And they get you in the army. And if you're a good guy, you end up in supply or you end up guarding roads somewhere. But if you play ball, you end up being a millionaire government murder technician or drug dealer or pilot. That's how all this works. I mean, I grew up with family who'd been army officers who would talk about this stuff. And, and by, by the way, my family's not special. It's like saying I grew up with family that drove 18 wheelers. This is a giant $500 billion a year industry. Your local crackhead is not running it. The big mega banks that run this country run the drugs. They made them illegal in the 30s so they could jack up the price and send hit teams to kill their competition. All right, I said I'd cover it in the third hour. It's time to stop being naive. I'm risking my life to bring you this information because they're using this stuff to destroy our country, and they also control the terrorist. The same narco-terrorist banks control the terrorist and use them to attack the public or to take the blame for attacks on the public to set up a police state over you and your family. I want to warn police and military that have gone along with this evil. You cannot make a deal with this level of evil. You've got to choose a side. Are we going to come back with the economy out today that Ron Paul has doubled his support in an index of polls in just the last two weeks? He's doubled his support. He is a top-tier candidate. If they weren't saying he couldn't win, he'd be number one undisputed right now. He's a major contender. I could have been a contender. Well, he is a contender. A major contender. But if you get into a fight and don't believe you can't win, you're going to lose. The key to a fight is knowing you've got the initiative and not thinking about who's going to win. Start swinging. That's who wins the fight. The person that doesn't think about winning the fight. The person that thinks about stomping time. That's what happens. It's about turning it loose. It's about opening up a can. And you know what I'm talking about out there. It's about committing, and that's the end of it. Whatever's happening, it's clobbering time. And if, if they end up stealing the election, it's like, oh, the COINTELPRO is like, well, you say there's election fraud. Why would you promote it? Because we'll prove election fraud by showing it. You don't prove where the enemy is without engaging them. You don't get stronger without fighting them. You don't put ideas out when you say, oh, it's rigged. I'm not taking the field. Let them put him in there with one man against three other gladiators. If they destroy him, it'll be an example to others, not of cowardice, but of strength. The truth is people don't cower when they see a martyr politically destroyed. They get angry. Somehow they've got a mind trick going to have everybody scared of fake terrorism and cowering under their tables from something statistically you know, that's extremely uh, rare. But shark bite's extremely rare. Most people won't go into the water past their necks at the beach because they're scared. There might be five shark deaths a year globally on average. Pull it up. Some years there's three. There's been as many as 12. So what? A shark bites your foot. Sometimes that happens. That happens to hundreds of people. whoop de doo whoop de doo But you won't even go in the water because of the shark. And a lot of you won't even get politically involved because you know there's a tyranny. And that's a point I was thinking about this morning that I, I, I've talked about before but not enough. And I'm going to say this, mention a few news items that are coming up, and then go to your calls. When the globalists staged 9-11, they did it in a very transparent way where governments, intelligence agencies, and corporations would know that it was an inside job. So for the general public, it's a dumbing down and acceptance of the police state. But for scientists and academics and others, they know What's going on? And so it was a message to the world. Yes, there's been a hard coup in America by the ruthless military industrial complex controlled by the big mega banks. Yes, this has happened. And the whole world better do what we say. And you notice Russia, China, everybody just rolled over and started groveling, going, wow, you just did that. You are bold. You think you're going to get away with blowing up all those towers and all of that and say guys in a cave did it? I mean, it scared the rest of the world. The arrogance, the bravada, the hubris, the chutzpah, 
the aplomb, whatever term you want to use to describe it, the recklessness, the crazed nature. See, there were dual messages there. The globalists are masters of that. And that's why there's these threats put out by CFR members like Hart that say, we stage terror attacks, Iran, do what we say. I mean, he put a public letter out saying, we stage Gulf of Tonkin, we stage the USS, uh, you know, the sinking of the Maine. Don't play games with us. Cheney, give us a bigger defense budget or nukes will to kill you. Rumsfeld this weekend, don't cut the defense budget or Al-Qaeda will hit you. Don't try to abolish the Federal Reserve or the anti-Federal Reserve people are going to blow up federal buildings. We're going to have to arrest all of you. It is 100% in your face. And when they even say it on TV, it's like a gangster going, you do what I say or I'm going to kill your whole family. You understand me and you know I mean it. They're communicating to people that are thinkers. Now, they think you're going to roll over. At a certain point, you just got to go, I'm done. Do whatever you're going to do. I'm coming after you. Because these people are going to wreck our society, wreck our world. I'm not worried about Alex Jones. This type of arrogant gangsterism. At the end of the day, I'm not even worried about my own family. You have to commit to this or they've got that power over you. You've got to fully all in and say, basically consider yourself and your whole family is already gone. That's the only way you get any type of protection. And it's not just protection from the globalist knowing you're committed that you care about your family so much you're willing to lose them because the human family is going to be lost if we don't. These reckless globalists and their attitude will destroy us. Their insane delusions of grandeur, their, their, their delusional mania, their feelings of invincibility, the same reason Hitler turned into Russia, into the winter, same reason uh, other dictators have done it. Napoleon Bonaparte, they always think they're invincible because everything they do to a certain point, as it gets bolder and bolder, society goes through a, a first part where people are so, so buffaloed by it, so, so, so bushwhacked, so shanghaied, psychically, so cowed that people go into shock. But as the tyranny gets worse and worse, instincts to survive, instincts for the species. Species survival kicks in, not individual survival. There's different types of instincts. There's a much deeper societal survival instinct. That's how men can charge machine gun nests, watching their compatriots being blown to bits. Still, well, you know, if we don't, they've been, you know, told this army's going to come take our land and take over our way of life and enslave our women. It's that ancient thing. So the men just, all right, it's time to die. Let's go. That is a false societal instinct for survival. The globalists are experts at that, directing that instinct so you give in to tyranny. You've got to really get the lay of the land intellectually. And then you've got to make the decision on whether you want humanity to survive. Because there's no doubt in my mind, my deep historical understanding to know the globalists are going to end up destroying us or almost destroying us in cataclysmic bioweapon wars, bio-releases, uh, super energy weapons, uh, all sorts of things they've developed that could easily destroy us. And so I'm not going to be insanely selfish because I know that's an illusion. I'm not going to use my talents to join the dark side and get some petty short-term temporal power for myself individually at the expense of my entire future genetic line and what humans are going to become. I am in love with future humans. I am in love with, with our technological developments and our beauty and our art. I am in love with the, with the projections of what I can't even begin to imagine the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard what God has in store for us if the species makes it out of this and really takes our destiny on. So I am rocket fuel, and so are you, to get this species to a type 1 civilization. That means off-world, able to survive as a species, even if the planet's destroyed. It is a prime directive in all life to procreate and survive and push the species forward. And so it is not courage. It is not honor. It is none of those. Those are just names we have for it. It is basic humanity, basic survival, 
of the genetics. And that's why I'm so angry at the globalist. They are running around splicing every life form they can, irrevocably creating horrible creatures, acting like they're God and doing a terrible job in their attempt to become like gods. And really screwing up this planet that we don't even know where it came from or exactly what the larger, I mean, we're on a planet, folks. I know God's there. I'm saying we don't know all how God did it. We, we can't even begin to imagine what God is. It, it's such a huge thing. And, and I, I mean, folks, have you looked out at the stars at night? I know I say this, words can't describe it. I mean, it was a champagne moon came up last night with giant red uh, sunset, like a, like a crown around the horizon. And this morning, a champagne moon came back up out of the haze and little birds flapping around in the trees and the cool wind. I mean, it's just like, my God, the evidence of God is all around us. And we've got a bunch of mad scientists creating glow-in-the-dark cats. That's back in the news today. And glow-in-the-dark monkeys and injecting insect genes in every mammal you can imagine. And it's already giving rise to mutated viruses and causing all sorts of problems. So, of course, I've got to get up here and not be afraid and speak out. Even though they can politically destroy me or send a hit team to get me. I want to ask the hit teams and I want to ask the bureaucrats... What is you're selling out for a bunch of paper that mega banks issue? You'd sell your mommy out for a suitcase of paper when when you can walk outside and stare into eternity and the universe and God all around you and you're ready to sell out? Sell out to what? It's the biggest joke I've ever seen. Live, ladies and gentlemen, we are alive in a, a planet of beauty and wonderment and creativity and blessings that just run over. But the Madison Avenue system teaches the public to feel empty and pathetic. People who say life is empty, well, they're television watchers. They're sports fans. They're empty. They're just trying to feed their bestial, low-level brutishness, and that will never fulfill you. Facing down evil will fulfill you. And it'll take you on a lot of different roads. But facing reality, that is where enlightenment, that is where fulfillment comes from. And my goal is to be real and to be true, true to oneself, true to my family, true to my culture. I guess they call that being honorable. I want to be a man of my word. I make mistakes. I'm not perfect. My flesh is strong. But we can defeat this evil. And we're going to defeat it by reaching out to the enforcers, the bureaucrats, the technicians of the system and, and really asking them, do you like the way things are going? Do you think a culture of lies is sustainable? Is this what you want for your children? Because when you talk about your children, you know, when you die, you join your fathers, you join your mothers. You join them in eternity. It's a great fraternity. A fraternity of eternity. But there's also that eternity of the future species. And that fraternity you have in that eternity. And it's a wonderful thing. And it's the greatest human attribute to pour yourself in to the betterment of society. The globalists are all about the wrecking of society. They're the polar opposite of what good is. They come to kill, steal, and destroy. I know we got Steve, Michael, Micah, Matt, Bob, and others. I just get on a roll here. NATO training to open an Indiana guard base, 700 troops to train there. The problem is that this just acclimates everybody, and they do have deals to use foreign troops in America. And more and more, we're just being conditioned Air Force times. You know, the U.S. Embassy is under attack in Kabul. This is what a real terror attack looks like. The West has been there 10 years. They want them out. And it is about opium. There's, there's tribes that want the full smack money for themselves. So that's just an opium war. You just decriminalize it and <laughs> they'll start growing uh, vegetables again. Uh, so we got that coming up. I got huge economic news, huge Ron Paul news. Uh, j just uh, insane amounts of key news, but uh, let's start going to calls. Uh, let's go to Bob in California. You're on the air. Go ahead, Bob. Hey, Alex. How are you? Good. Um, I'm a first-time caller, Prison Planet subscriber, member of We Are Change LA, We Are Change Hollywood. On the 11th of every month, we do an outreach where we give out DVDs, primarily about 911, and. Um, Oh, over the last oh, three years or so, we we get a lot of support from when we do it over the freeway. We get a lot of trucks honking at us and waving and 
giving us support. We had an outreach on Sunday at Santa Monica Pier and Third Street Promenade. And boy, I'll tell you, that mainstream media really, the propaganda over the last week, we had a lot of people arguing with us. And they yeah, no, no, so they're they trying... I've never seen such a push since 9-11. They're trying to reinvoke that fear and get people to believe it's real so they can bring the toy back out. They want to run that play of stage terror so bad they can taste it. And so, yes, they're trying to reinvoke it. There's a big pushback, a big psyop. Well, the hardest thing is for me, I mean, I'm ostracized from my family. It's really hard. Even, you know, it's hard even in the workplace to, uh, you know, not get carried away with this because the truth keeps marching on. Well, I think with people, when you're arguing with them, make it more fun. Say, hey, look at Building 7 for me. Hour number two, let's continue with your phone calls. Bunch of news coming up. I'm going to go over some of the news with Alfred Adask. Matt in Florida, thanks for holding. Welcome. Mr. Jones. Hey, buddy. Hey, sir. Thanks for taking my call. Uh, I was at the uh, Tampa debate last night, and uh, I wasn't in the main room, but I was in the uh, watch debate party, which was next door. And uh, there was uh, a lot of Ron Paul support there, and uh, Rick Perry had a lot of guys there, too. And um, afterwards, everybody waited for the candidates, and they came over to our side to speak. And uh, Dr. Paul didn't show up, but um, Rick Perry came out, and uh, it was like a total rock star, uh, blaring rock music, and... Uh, big smile and high five and, and uh, you know, it's kind of everything you would expect from a, a male cheerleader. And um, Yeah, it's about making people feel like they're winners and that they're betting on the guy that's handsome. Uh, if people want another Ken doll, like Obama, then, then they get what they deserve. Uh, and if people like forced inoculations and handing roads over to foreign corporations and Bilderberg attending, and, and what's worse about about Perry is I've now learned from a person I really trust and have known for many years, I've known for about 18 years, a prominent individual here in Austin, that Rick Perry was anti-New World Order in 1998 and gave him literature about it. I mean, Rick Perry knows all about this stuff. And he's not just some puppet. That is disgusting. And the uh, local media was there, and they were uh, doing interviews. And uh, they gave me an interview, and uh, I laid it down pretty hard on Rick Perry and the, just what you just said about NAFTA and the Gardasil and being Al Gore's uh, best, hardest worker. And, uh, and Hillary Lover. I mean, it's, it's hard to get it all out. There's so much. Yes, sir, but the best part is, you know, and then she asked me who I was there, and I told her I was there to see Dr. Paul. And uh, then she said, um, okay, I didn't get a bite. Let's, uh, let's start from the top. And I just said, you know, no thank you, because I don't want to be uh, spliced into uh, – you know, making me look like an idiot because I'm a Dr. Paul supporter. Um, well, but, you uh, don't know what she was calculating. I mean, if it's serious. local media, a lot of times they're not total propagandists. I'm not saying you're wrong, but it's better just to give people bites and let the chips fall where they may. And if they're deceptive with it, that's their problem. Yes, sir. Uh, also, I just want to make one more quick point. Is uh, I've been a paid firefighter for seven years, and I've got six guys on my crew, and three of us listen to you regularly, and the other... Uh, two more listen to you uh, quite a bit. And uh, I just want to say about all the dog and pony show about 9-11, um, you know, we, it's not the right way to honor all the Americans that died by having a parade. The only way to really honor these people is to bring the perpetrators to trial and they can end up like Stalin. Well, you're absolutely right. Most people can't believe they've got an evil system running them until after it comes out. It's like finding out your neighbor has got 10 people buried in the backyard, but he was such a nice man. It's so shocking. But a lot of times it is the people that come off as real friendly and slick. That's who you got to really watch. You know, somebody who obviously is foul, you at least know they're coming. Uh, but, but, but going back, with your firefighter friends, do they question the official story of 9-11? Uh, everybody on my crew but one. Um, unfortunately, throughout the department, uh, our numbers aren't that strong. I don't know exactly how many, but uh, I've definitely seen seen it grow a lot. Uh, I figured it out about five years ago, and uh, I've been very outspoken. And I was, uh, uh, you know, called a kook and all that stuff. And now people are starting to come around, and uh, I can actually have conversations with people at work. So um, it is. Uh, well, don't feel bad way. when they call you a kook. That's because they're in darkness, they're ignorant, and you're lovingly helping them. 
In fact, enjoy it when you get called a kook because it means they're getting upset. You're you're getting through to them, and it's just a service you're doing. And I know it's a painful news to bring, but you're making a sacrifice. That's why you're a firefighter. Uh, briefly, what do you think of them barring the actual first responders from the event? Uh, it makes me sick, and uh, I think everybody should be up in arms about that. And uh, it's just it's just a slap in the face. It's so disrespectful. It, it, it certainly is. God bless you. Be safe out there while you're helping your community. Micah, truth, Michael, sir. Steve, Ken, and others. We are joined by Alfred Adask, who we had on, I don't know, six months ago or so, when 60 Minutes had a special about himself and others, just demonizing him like he's incredibly evil. And then all he does is talk about the Constitution, Bill of Rights, common sense. Uh, and, of course, we discussed then the fact that they're rebranding terrorism off of al-Qaeda over to domestic groups that want to get our republic back. And his website is adask.wordpress.com. Uh, here's his bio. I'm Alfred Adask and the author of virtually all of the text published on this website. And then it just goes into all the things that he's uh, done over the years fighting the globalists. So we're going to be talking to him uh, for the rest of the hour and taking your calls. And then I've got news items. I want to get his take on things happening in the news and uh, what he thinks of the globalists. Because they know that their vaccines are killing people. Uh, they openly now admit that the government's growing the opium in Afghanistan and shipping it into the U.S. and having the troops grow it. It came out in federal court in Chicago. This, is again, is in the El Paso Times, uh, Narcosphere News. It's up on Infowars.com. Federal filing where when they bust these narco-terrorists now, they're bringing into court the fact that they work for the CIA bringing narcotics in. And the federal government's saying, yes, national security, it's true. But still, we want them to go to jail. Uh, that's kind of like Hal Turner. Uh, who attacked me for like a decade saying I was covering up for Israel when we're critical of Israel. And he used to work with Sean Hannity, and he would say, kill this federal judge, get that federal judge, this judge needs to die and never get in trouble. And I said, that guy's a fed. And I said, you better watch it, buddy. They'll set you up. Well, people hacked his email and got his emails from the FBI where they were handling him. And so he was no longer useful, so they put him uh, in jail. And what he's facing the trial right now for stuff he was ordered to do on record. And the FBI came in and said, Mr. Turner is our highest level national security uh, operative, not an agent, but he does work in our employ. And uh, but go ahead and put him in prison. <laughs> See, that's a message all you guys need to get through your head. The Sinaloa drug cartel head is, is in the news. Here it is right here in my little hand. It's up on Infowars.com with a link to the federal filing. You'll be on the federal court's website. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we brought in tens of tons of cocaine. Yeah, we're shipping guns into Mexico, Honduras. We're shipping them into Illinois, Texas, Florida, California. That's now all mainstream news. And nobody gets in trouble except their own minions. So, so we're talking about a synthesis of evil that runs our society. You see, you could have an a, a emperor, philosopher, king who wanted to build public works, wanted to educate people, and wanted to build a civilization. And we've seen maybe 20 cases of that or less in 6,000 years of recorded history. And you'll see civilizations leap forward under that because they actually take the largesse and actually build things for populations. But what happens is, and have a vision, and, 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 and try to bring science to the public, the problem is they always die. And maybe their son isn't as bad, but the grandson's a psychopath. And then he has an even crazier son. And pretty soon, it's Roman emperors marrying their horse. Caligula would march the horse in. It would go to the bathroom. He'd have the high priest read it like tea leaves. I'm not joking. This is mainline history. They normally gut a bull and read the guts or spill the blood all over them. And how the splatters were, they would then pour tin. But he made them worship the horse's dung, basically, just as an act of power an act of insanity or burn part of the city for fun like Nero and get so decadent they commit suicide. This is what happens. The worst of the worst get in control and you get a Stalin, a Hitler, a Mao, I mean, a, a, a Pol Pot that Zbigniew Brzezinski bragged he supported who killed 30% plus of the people of Cambodia. And then Brzezinski writes books bragging. They, you know, they, they brag whenever Brzezinski walks into a globalist meeting. They're like, oh, your graciousness. They get off on how many deaths they've committed. 
So, so that's my view on their philosophy. There really isn't a philosophy at all. It's just trampling and being trampled. Always pressing on the nerve of power. We're the priest of power, Winston. In fact, later I want to read it. We'll hold it to ask you into the next hour to give them the full time here because I'm on a roll. But will you print me uh, from 1984? You can just type in um, Winston. Picture a boot stomping on a human face forever. It's about 10 paragraphs above that and about five below that. I want to read that later because that describes the full globalist system. It's a world built by sadists and psychopaths to carry out always greater and greater dumbing down and ugliness because it's beautiful to them. Liberty and independence is, 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 is anathema. It's like nails on a chalkboard to these people. Alfred Adas, good to have you here with us. Give us your view on the philosophy of the parasites and what they're building and your fight against them. Well, I can tell you that... Uh, it's good to be here. First off, Alex, I appreciate you having me on. But we were, I was one of seven defendants that were sued back in, uh, the case started in 2001. I wasn't added until 2006. I was the last of seven defendants sued for the manufacture and distribution of a controlled substance. And the controlled substance was colloidal silver. All right, it wasn't heroin or cocaine or something like that or methamphetamine. That I can buy colloidal. at HEB and Whole Foods here in Austin right now. That's exactly right. And I volunteered to be fiduciary for a trust. The trust was one of the defendants in the case. They made me a defendant. We were threatened with fines. Each defendant, $25,000 per day. That's $9 million per year. I read the relevant case, and I guarantee being sued for $9 million a year focuses your attention. And I read the relevant law. And what we discovered, I read the definition of drugs in both the state and federal health code. And this goes to your notion about what their philosophy is. The Texas Attorney General wrote in part in his case, he said, the key to this case lies in determining at law, not as a matter of fact, whether the defendant's colloidal products met the definition of drug when mislabeled. And then he quotes from the Texas Health and Safety Code, section 431, Point zero zero two subparagraph 14, which defines the word drug. And it says drug means article recognized the United States pharmacopoeia national formulary, any supplement to it. Articles designed or intended for the use in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, or prevention of disease in man or other animals. Now, I saw that, and the first thing I thought is, right, God, why the people are damn crazy. The people who wrote this thing don't understand English. When they say man or other animals, they're not saying man or animals. They're saying man or other animals, which means they deem man to be an animal. And what you discovered is something we similarly discovered uh, decades ago, and, and, and for all of us, we discovered this in different ways. In hundreds of globalist documents and documents going back thousands of years, all governments that oppress, Hitler did it, the Babylonians yep. did it, the Israelites did it, yep. they would always list the slaves as not human. We That's listed right. blacks as not human. It's a, it's a legalese. They see themselves as exalted and awake, and that's what they mean in the movie They Live. When you have the glasses, they say, I've got one that can see. When you actually converse with a globalist in person, mm -hmm. they shake in fear because they, and, then, and they'll say, oh, you're a human. And, and, and that's what Frank Herbert wrote about in Dune, is that the elite don't see most of us as human. Go ahead. Well, first time I saw it, I just thought it was a mistake. Then they said man or other animals a second time in the same definition. Then I read the federal code at Title 21, Section 321, subparagraph G, subsection or subsection G, subparagraph 1. And it says, again, virtual identical definition of drugs. Drugs are for man or other animals. What we did, I realized that they are treating it, the, the presumption for, the, for these definitions is that we are animals. And I also understand enough about the Bible where I know that at Genesis uh, chapter one, sections 26 through 28, uh, it says on the sixth day, God created man in his image and gave man dominion over the animals. Which means that as a Jew or a Christian and probably even as a Muslim, I assume the Muslim faith has a similar notion about Genesis, although I don't know that to be true. But as a Jew or a Christian, you can't call me an animal without violating my freedom of religion.
I drafted a defense in this case that was based on freedom of religion. And I said, you can't call me an animal. You can't charge me 25 grand a day based on the presumption that I'm an animal because I am a man made in God's image and I'm endowed. And then I went on with the declaration. And you won. And, and I want you to continue with this and yeah. then get into what's happening currently. But you're telling us who the globalists are. They see us as animals. But, but what you've hit on here is so central. Even if someone's an agnostic or an atheist, Yes. And, and they don't believe in God. They need to say, I, I believe in a higher power, because if you don't, there's always a higher power than some king rat, some strong man, some gang, some guy named Humongous with a motorcycle gang is going to put himself above you. That's what Thomas Jefferson was saying. We're saying, uh-uh, buddy, we got freedom in the universe. And we if you don't get it from God, you don't get it. That's right. All right. That's the point to this. If you're willing to be an animal, you can be treated just like a chicken. That's right. It's Tyson their rules. The globalists plan. understand this. They believe yeah. they've been given the power of God to be a human, not an animal. We've got again. This is all law. Well, I agree, and it's not just all law. It goes back thousands of years. This is part of spiritual warfare. This isn't a new situation. It's the fun. It's the one of the essential acts of genocide is dehumanization. You can go to genocide. Uh, genocide. Uh, watch.org, and they've got a document up no, there. No, no, they the always H do it. You are stating yeah. a giant, yeah. naked truth, a trillion-pound elephant in the living room, and half the audience, even though they're smart, is saying, what are they talking about? Let's go back to this point, uh, Alfred. Uh, uh, um, a lot of times, you, you know, we, we stay on this topic, but I want to get into some other areas as well, straight ahead. Uh, and, and, and by the way, I, I've, I've got to get you on uh, on a routine basis. You're just amazing. Alfred right Dask. Sir, continue. Sir, please continue um, uh, breaking down your research of the globalist and the world they want to build. We understand they think they're gods and we're animals and they engineer us like animals and lie to us. And it's uh, people that are part of the establishment, even at lower level, get off on deceiving, get off on dumbing down, get off on weakening uh, they want to get rid of the family. So, so, so where are these people going from your research? What are they wanting to build? I don't know what they want to build exactly. They want power. They are lovers of money. They want power, and they are definitely ungodly. I mean, the whole concept of sovereignty flows from the idea that you receive your rights from God. If you're an animal, you have no more rights than a chicken, a pig, or a goat, and the only thing to distinguish you from those other animals is you have firearms. They take your firearms away, and they can handle you just like the rest of the livestock. It's the only thing from their perspective that makes you dangerous. But our Declaration of Independence started out and said we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. This is the foundation for individual sovereignty. In the past, the only sovereigns prior to the Declaration were the King of England, the King of Spain, the King of Italy, and so on. Those people were kings because they had the divine right of kings. They received their rights directly from God, and all else were subjects because they did not get their rights directly from God. Now, Alfred, I called this the giant trillion-pound elephant in the room. There it is again. In yep. all cultures, everyone had always been seen as animals, as the subcast as the garbage. In fact, in many ancient cultures, the elites would put animals up above humans to teach us we're trash. That's what the modern environmental movement is, not yep. to help the environment, but to teach us to self-loathe, to not believe that we're special and made in the image of, a, of, of the creator. It's all meant to make us think uh, bad about ourselves. And now it's so alien to people to realize the globalist view when just a few hundred years ago, there were no systems where people weren't basically seen as chattel. Well, the one exception, again, in England, for example, the king and the king alone was sovereign because he had the divine right of kings. When our founders came across and they said, no, wait, in the Declaration of Independence, they said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, they meant all men, including kings, were created equal and all were endowed by their creator with certain un unalienable rights. That elevated all men to the status of sovereigns. And under those circumstances, government became our servant rather than our master. It's the reason the Supreme Court 
ruled in Chisholm versus Georgia, 1793. They said uh, this was a nation, the people of the United States of America are sovereigns, plural, without subjects. It's based on this principle in the Declaration of Independence that we all effective. The unalienable rights, in my opinion, are equivalent to the divine right of kings. We get them from God. No, they are. Sense. That's why all the legalese and bureaucracy that's outside of true common law is you are now subject to seizure. You are now a yeah. licensure. Yeah. You're, you're being licensed yeah. as a slave. You're being given, uh, and black slaves had to wear these, a tag around your neck with a note saying where you're allowed to go. And here are these cops thinking it's a normal system, thinking it's constitutional, thinking it's to keep everybody safe. Yeah. And we're all running around with our little papers. I mean, even just 60 years ago, we knew Germany was bad. You had to have papers to travel internally in the country. Now we just accept it. And in New York City, I wanted to raise this. They arrested 9-11 truthers, not at Ground Zero, but basically anywhere in lower Manhattan and, and, and would arrest you if you spoke on a street corner and handed out literature. But others who were handing out pro-government, they were allowed. I mean, we're getting very far down this road. Yeah, I know. I, I agree. And for what it's, uh, we've had people, I've been contacted by one man from Australia, another guy from uh, England who's heard me talk about man or other animals relative to the drug laws. And they've researched the English drug laws and they researched the Australian drug laws. And they tell me that you find the same presumption there. The people are animals. The reason this is so important is the presumption that the people are animals laid the foundation, lies at the heart of the, the drug war, the war on drugs that was started by President Nixon back in 1971. It's based on the presumption that we're all just livestock. And the war on drugs laid the foundation for much of the modern police state. And the police state laid the foundation for the prison industrial complex. I've heard that 70% of people in, in federal pens are there on drug-related crimes. All of this is perched on a little definition of drugs that presumes the people to be animals in violation of our freedom of religion. And you've beat them in federal court. Let's talk more about that case. Get into some other news and phone calls with Alfred Adask right here on GCNlive.com. I'm Alex Jones. Stay back live here, my friends. And I do want to get to Micah and Ken and Michael and many others that are patiently holding here in just a few minutes. Uh, I should add that we are seeing something really historical happening right now. Watching CNBC, listening to Bloomberg on radio, reading all their statements. We knew this was coming more than a decade ago, but we're now seeing it. And after bailout after bailout in Europe, they're not bailouts. They're, they're government taxes paid directly to the big six private megabanks. And each time it happens, the countries get more in debt because the countries go in debt to give the money to the private central banks. That's why they don't just monetize and give it to the banks to get the money off their books that then causes inflation. But that's still a better thing than publicly raising taxes, cutting infrastructure to implode the economy and then paying that to the banks. Who are the ones you're bailing out? It's so simple, it's complex. They're the ones that engage in the fraud. You're bailing them out. But then you owe them money because you bailed them out because they're the people that authorize your government, the euro, the dollar, you name it, to issue the currency. Now, they're openly saying the problem is the Germans won't vote for this and have had two elections since the bailout started and they're about to get rid of Merkel. And I've heard them on CNBC and Bloomberg say it's terrible that there's democracy. Of course, Really, it should be a republic, but the point is they're saying it's too bad the people can vote because this is going to cause a world depression. Now, they've already maneuvered us to a world depression, but they then destroy confidence by saying the markets are down because the people aren't bailing us out. But the new third bailout isn't a bailout. It's transferring what's left of national sovereignty through the euro to this private banking system. So here is world government run by private corporations that have created the crisis, openly holding Europe hostage while they have their banker chiefs go out and destroy confidence. Same thing that was done to get the super Congress passed here. Same thing that was done with the bailout. 
Alfred, uh, watching this, uh, what's your view on how things are going for the New World Order? Well, I think they're desperate. I think things are, I think, I can't remember the name. Uh, uh, one of the former secretaries of state criticized Bush during when he Bush first botched the invasion of Iraq and got bog, bogged down there. I can't think of the man's name, but he says, you've set the new world order back 30 years. All right. I think these people know they're on the ropes. You had, you quoted earlier where Hillary Clinton said they're losing the information war. All right, the information battle. I think they know they're on the ropes and they are desperate and they are pushing as hard as they can to make this happen before it all blows up in their face. We're in a situation where it's like two railroad trains coming for the same crossing and both of them are trying to go as fast as they can to get there first and get through without getting hit. But uh, we'll see, we're coming for a, we're, we are approaching a great collision and we'll see how it unfolds. We're going to see stage terror attacks, new wars, bioweapon releases. Yeah. We're entering a time of some of the greatest tumult and upheaval this earth has ever seen in human activities. And by the way, that was Brent Scrocoff, uh, former national security advisor to George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, that did say George W. Bush had set the new world order back 30 years. And so it's like NASCAR. They were three, yeah. three laps ahead of us. But since the globalists have gotten caught lying about WMD, staging 9-11, and other events, they are now only about a car link ahead of us. Mm -hmm. Their tires are bald. They're yeah. almost out of gas. And there's smoke coming out from under the hood. Yeah. I understand. We are at the little man behind the curtain moment. All right. People are beginning to understand that this thing has been run by a relatively small group of people who can be had if we want to stand up and do something about it. I listened to one of your ads earlier before the probe, before I got on at least, and you were talking about a food crisis. Let me ask you, do you know who the first economist was? There have been quite a few, but tell me. Joseph in the Bible goes all the way back to 1800 BC and you can read about it in Genesis chapter 47. I was when I was again this this relates to the food crisis. This this is a little bit long but this relates to the food crisis and what Genesis 47 it talks about Joseph in the Old Testament where what he, he telling the Egyptians the whole story about you know he had the dream and you've got to have 7 years of grain yep, put back because yep, of the famine. Yep. Yep, that's it. But the way I was taught it when I went to Bible school as a kid is Joseph, he knew there were going to be seven good years and then there were going to be seven bad years. And therefore, he saved up the extra grain in the, in the seven good years so they'd have, so the people that have grain in the seven bad years. That's not true. Here's what happened. And you can read this in Genesis chapter 47. And it says, and there was no bread in all the land for the famine was sore and it was very sore and that the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan faded by reason of famine. In other words, we're into the seven bad years. Now, Joseph had stored up grain in the seven good years. But when the seven bad years came, here it says Genesis 47, 14, and Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan for the grain which they brought. And Joseph brought the money into the Pharaoh house and when the money was all spent in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said give us bread for why should we die in thy presence for our money faileth what they didn't understand Joseph was selling grain he wasn't giving it to the people. He knew there was going to be a shortage. He, he cornered the market on grain because he knew famine was coming. Then he sold the grain in the first year for money. He took all the money. He gave it to the Pharaoh. It moved into the money's house, into the Pharaoh's house. They took it out of circulation. And without money, the people could not work effectively to work their way through the famine. This reminds me of 1933, our government took the gold out of circulation. And in 1968, they took the silver out of circulation. And in that regard, they are paralleling what Joseph did 3,800 years ago. And it goes on the second year, Joseph, they come back and they say, we need some more food. Joseph said, give your cattle and I will give you for your cattle, he'll mean give you grain if the money failed. He know it failed because he took it out of circulation. The people sold all their cattle in the second year to Joseph. In the third year, they came back. They were hungry again. They needed more. And this time, they sold themselves into slavery and all of their land to Pharaoh. And that's exactly what the bankers have done. We're entering that's the third exactly year. The and, and every time we get in trouble, they bail us out by us bailing them out. We give them our money I mean, this is all scientifically done, 
And I tell you, Alfred, I learned very few new things from guests, and I'm learning stuff from you today. Well, I'll tell you, that Genesis 47 is just astonishing. You read it, and you read it closely, you realize, my God, they're explaining how economics works, and they understood it 3,800 years ago. I don't think it's, a, it's, it's an accident that a modern economics text is almost impossible to understand. I don't think you want, I don't think they want you to understand it. Joseph understood economics. You take the money out of circulation, corner the market on food, and you can put the people into bondage. And let me stop you there. So, They've so, taken the money and put it in Pharaoh's house. For yes. three years now, They've taken 16 trillion domestically. The tens of trillions that went overseas, Bloomberg says it's more like 28 trillion. Other economists I have on say it's more like 18, whatever. They've taken the tens of trillions of our money that we've got to pay taxes on and interest. They've given it to the mega families. But, but people are worried about inflation. It, it, it hasn't been that bad yet because they hoarded it and did not loan it back. So they put us under great bondage of debts that's fraudulent. Yep. They put us under taxes, under austerity, which they know kills the economy. All these other independent economists are saying, why are you doing this? This is killing the economy. They yeah. further put us uh, under the famine while they fully control all the money holding it in Pharaoh's house and then come back and say, give us absolute power in a private corporate world government and we'll fix it. And the people give them even more power and it doesn't yeah. because at the end of the day, they don't want people here in Egypt the globalists want us dead. They yeah. want the entire land. They don't want our oxen. They don't want our children. They don't want our women. They want us all wiped out and dead. New world order, they complete, total domination, end game. I agree. I agree. And, you know, you mentioned food crisis. They've taken the money away. If they can if they can shut the food supply down under the pretext of an economic collapse or whatever, I guarantee you people will follow this government to get themselves a bowl of rice. They'll do whatever is required to stay alive. They did it 3,800 years ago. Joseph did it. It's right there in the Bible if you care to read it. And they are on the verge of perhaps doing the same thing or at least attempting to do the same thing today. Alfred Adask, uh, I want to go to calls, but hopefully we keep you a little bit in the next hour. Go ahead. Uh, Let's continue, uh, uh, because I want to bring up another modern example of what's happening, and then perhaps you can give us a historical or biblical parallel. I think people are learning right now more than ever why if you know history, you know the present and the future, because humans act the same, yeah. and, and, and global technocrats and corrupt empires and social engineers learn the same tricks back then. Today, they're just even more slick, more controlling, with added chemicals in the food and water to fog our minds so that we're not oper operating at anywhere near our proper capacity. The drug war. It's now come out again in federal court that, yes, the ATF and CIA are shipping in, in some cases, hundreds of tons in, in this latest filing of cocaine with Sinaloa in the last five years, arming gangs all over Latin America and the U.S. to kill the other gangs that don't launder their money through the mega banks through Pharaoh's house. Because, again, they can't have that money out there helping people. They've got to hoard it because it's, yep. it, it's a tax on production. It's a tax to make people poor so you control them. It's, it's, it's about putting the brakes on a powerful uh, economy. It's about making you poor because if you become wealthy, you become independent, and you don't want to be a slave. Uh, we're so productive, they have to work to shut down human commerce and activity. They have to uh, talk about shutting down the overheating economy. So continuing, what's the drugs being shipped in all about? What's the shipping guns into Mexico all about? Uh, what's uh, you know, all of this about in, in your view? Well, the, the great, what's the, what's the principal addictive ingredient in cocaine? It's the same addictive ingredient that you find in marijuana and methamphetamine and all the rest of the illegal drugs. And the principal addictive ingredient is cash. That's what everybody, you legalize the drugs and you take the money out of it. You know, I remember back in the 1960s, they were talking about the, I remember a Time, Time Magazine article, they were saying, oh my God, the drug, drug uh, smugglers are bringing so much, making so much money, they'll be able to elect their own congressmen and senators. And what would they do? Legalize drugs? The last thing they want to do is legalize drugs. You legalize drugs, you take the money out of it. There'd be some people who would still use it.
but most people are addicted to the cash that's hey, involved in the drugs. Hey, 85 years ago, Alfred, as you know, mm -hmm. you could walk into any corner drug store and buy laudanum, that's buy right. heroin, buy cocaine, and it was seen as what losers did, yeah. and very few people were on drugs. I've seen the statistics. I mean, it was it was a sad thing. And yeah, I've been out in the countryside and come across an old homestead, and back in the trash pile, you see hundreds of laudanum bottles, little brown <laughs> bottles. They're everywhere. And yeah. but let me tell you, you had a toothache or whatever, or had the flu, you drink that, there's no more pain. A lot of people did just use it. But when you make it illegal, it puts the cash in it. That's it puts exactly the cars, right. the girls. Now young kids think it's cool. The perfect yeah. bait to sell the public on using it. That's exactly right. That's why they don't want to legalize. That's why they want the war on drugs in order to maintain the illusion they're trying to do something about it. The truth is they want drugs to be illegal. And then they That's use it to corrupt the problem. cops. Then they use Absolutely. it to corrupt the cops. And once you've got the cops corrupt, now you can move on to other corruption. One of the things I observed years ago, I published a magazine called The Anti-Shyster, and you could, you could see which states had the most corrupt judiciaries. And we thought Texas was number one, but in the end, I gave the nod to Florida. But it was essentially the states where drugs were being imported into this country. The drugs coming into Florida came in in such mass that virtually every judge in the state ultimately became corrupt. The same thing, much the same thing happened in Texas and along the borders. It was the states where the drugs were pouring into the country. That's where the judiciary was most corrupt because that's where the money was flowing freely to bribe the judges. That drug money helped, and it corrupted the Just 10 years of alcohol prohibition turned Chicago mm -hmm. from a bustling, predominantly uh, Irish, uh, you know, a Christian, a German Christian type enclave into the most co corrupt city probably in the country. Just 10 years yeah. of that liquor money, which, again, they use well-meaning Christians to ban alcohol, but it turns out... Key insiders were behind actually getting it passed. And so they were making a hundred times what they were making before conservatively. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean. <sighs> and again, bringing the liquor in out of Canada through Chicago. Right now, if you see drug enforcement to some degree, drug enforcement is perpetrated against, in my opinion, against those drug cartels that are less favored. Of course. The ones that are more favored, hey, they can move that stuff in and out without much problem. They're just eliminating competition for the big boys. Not with just not much problem. I see reports every few years of state police stop 18-wheeler with three and a half tons of pure cocaine, meaning from source. Yeah. And, and the CIA shows up, they order it, and they let the truck just drive right out to delivery. And they tell the state police, stand down, Bubba, that's our, that's our money. I mean, no wonder. Listen, I had a friend in college. And his dad was a senior FBI agent. And, and, and I was smart, you know, when I was, I guess it was actually in high school because it was the gym. And then, and then I knew him a little bit into college. And I, would, I went over to their house. It was like in the fa most fancy area of Austin. Uh, I mean, it was probably a three, four million dollar house then. You know, it would be like 10 million today. And I'm like, is your dad into stocks? Is your mom rich or something? And the next door neighbor was the lady who, uh, B Barney the purple dinosaur. I remember going to a cookout. And it's like, here's, here's the lady who invented Barney. I mean, this is like, you know, this is. You know, 10 bedroom houses up on the best part of Austin overlooking the river. And uh, it's like, no, it was just an FBI agent. And I'm like, well, d d has your dad, uh, <laughs> has your dad inherited something? And uh, I don't think, you know, they liked that question. And the dad came over and was like, why are you asking those questions for? But, but the point is, then I learned most of these guys live like this. They're all, I mean, this is incredible. I saw a friend of mine, in fact, what he, not exactly a friend. He was a boyfriend of a woman I knew, her daughter. And his dad was a tax court judge. And he was helping, he was, his dad build a new house uh, outside of Dallas and out more or less in the country. That house had to be worth at least a half million dollars. It had secret passages in it. It had a place you could hide and rest, that sort of thing. There's no way that man was building that house on his salary as a tax court judge. I mean, it was just obvious evidence. The guy is, he was dirty. You know, I like the son, but the father, I never met the father, but the guy had to be taking bribes. Well, they admit it now that police uh, are keeping a lot of the money they seize. If, you see, if they get it from the feds, they seize it, give it to the feds, they get it back directly. But if it goes into the state fund, they only get a certain percentage back. All right, I promise we're going to your phone calls on the other side with Alfred Adas. I'm Alex Jones. 
Infowars.com and PrisonPlanet.tv are the websites. We'll be on TV tonight, 7 o'clock Central, PrisonPlanet.tv. Looks like we're going to probably be able to get the gentleman who was arrested uh, in New York for daring to speak out against the inside job. We're becoming North Korea. Looks like we're going to have him on at the bottom of the next hour working on that. Alfred Adask with us, some of the next hour. I appreciate everybody holding so patiently. I want to go to Michael, then Ken, then Mitch, then Bill, and Arnold, and others. Uh, let's go ahead and go to Michael in California. Thanks for holding. You're on the air with Alfred Adask. Go ahead. Good afternoon, Alex. I hope I'm not off topic. Uh, I want to uh, first tell you that uh, leaders are chosen before they're even born, as the Bible says. They're selected. So you're in good shape. Alfred, uh, thank you so much for... Um, I, I want to uh, uh, do a three-point a, a three blast. You were speaking to Jesse Ventura about a few, a few interviews back, and he, on, on the break, on, coming on the break, he mentioned Dr. Mary's monkey. I'm not plugging, but Dr. Mary's monkey talked about the polio shot. That was, that was doled out through ampules of 200 million between 1963 and 1965, which was sexually transmitted. Now, everybody probably on the planet had an SB40 in them. And well, that's not just in a book. Um, that that's an official government declassified. You can just search SV40 documents, and the government talks about over a hundred million people probably dying from it, and all these new cancers. And they've got a CBC interview with one of the scientists that worked with Sock, and he makes a joke about, "Well, there's too many people, anyways." I mean, <laughs> yeah, we're killing hundreds of millions. You see, something Hitler couldn't even do or Stalin, they just do right through the shots. But because it kills you 20, 30 years later, it's a soft kill. It's just like radiation. Oh, if it kills you in 10 years, so what? But if you drink something and it kills you in five minutes, everybody gets really scared. Alfred, your view on that? Well, it's a, from their perspective, they don't want to kill you until you have outlived your economic usefulness. That's another reason. All right. Um, if they can make everybody die at age 65, then the Social Security problem is resolved. Uh, it's They don't want to keep you on when you are consuming, purely consuming, rather than And they're producing. being honest about that. That's why they have the case for killing granny cover of Newsweek. It says kill old people. You got Bill Gates telling teachers, hey, if we kill granny, you'll get 10 jobs. And the people are like, kill, kill. This idea that you kill somebody and get something, the predators are teaching their armies. Do you know why you shouldn't kill people? Well, that's, you don't kill like somebody a, unless you're defending yourself. Well, here's, here's, here's the fundamental reason why murder is wrong. It's because, in my opinion, Genesis 9, 6, it says the reason you can't kill a man is because man is made in God's image. That's right. It's up to God. Well, it's not just up to God, but the point is to kill a man is to destroy an image of God. It's effectively an act of blasphemy. It's why well, to be clear about, but to be clear the about crime. the Ten Commandments, it says, "Thou shalt not murder," That's and they've true. changed it to kill. That's uh, true. Murder well, means wrongly kill somebody. Uh, but but I mean, you're you're absolutely authorized. You know, the, the bunch of verses. If somebody comes in to kill you in the night, rise up and kill them. But this goes back to the concept of if they can reduce you to the status of animals, you're no longer in God's image. Yes. If you're no longer in God's image, they can whack you. They can just take you out like a hive of wasps or a nest of rats or anything else. Yep, it's all legalese. Yep. Why, and I appreciate your call, caller. Why, uh, Alfred, uh, from studying the globalist, I mean, I, I know I have my perspectives, but why do they have to tell you what they're going to do to you beforehand? Just like legally... When you're seizing property or taking it by adverse possession, you've got to publish it in the newspaper three times. Is that like the vampire has to trick you to invite them in? You, they have to effectively get your consent. That's what it appears to be. As crazy as that sounds, it appears that the whole system is based on your consent. Do you consent to be an animal? Then we're going to treat you as an animal. And they have published that you're an animal in the law. Do you consent to that? Okay, then we can handle you like an animal. They need your consent. That's right. So That's why everything's consent. about getting you to consent. Your calls for another 20 minutes with Alfred Adask. Then I'm going to get into a bunch of news. I've got to get to the news. I do all this research and then don't end up getting to half of it. Big developments in Palestine. Russia supports Palestinian bid to win U.N. statehood. This is starting to come to a head. So I'm going to get into some geopolitical news. Also some Gardasil news. Uh, Alfred Adask uh, is our guest. And I'm telling you, from my 20 years of research, 16, coming up on 17 years on air, he really gets it. And again, even if you don't believe 
the stuff he's talking about, you hear Bible, you know, I say, hey, they're doing rituals at Skull and Bones. You're like, I don't believe in the devil. It doesn't matter if you don't believe in the devil or not. The people that run this planet, they do. It's like if I say there's a group of aborigines worshiping the shark gods on some island and killing their neighbors for it. The point is, whether the shark god's real or not, these people are driven by it. And so, so what he's telling you is the truth. The controllers of this world are basically psychic vampires. They enjoy murder and death and killing, and they have all these weird rules, and they like to push you and henpeck you till you let the TSA put the hand in the pants and let them microwave you because you go and consent. And then after you've consented for a while, then they say possession's nine-tenths, then they begin to force. They also have weird rules that once they get about half the public to do something, then they start forcing. And we're getting to the forcing point. Once you get to a forcing point, it always just goes downhill very quickly. So the trap door is opening up. Everything we've seen so far is kind of like sliding into the cave entrance, but we can still get out. We're about to fall 5,000 feet. Okay, you I mean you think stuff's bad now. We're now scrabbling to a point where the talk is going to be over and it's better to die on your feet than live on your knees. I, everything I've done is tried to stop that. And I'm not for offensive operations, but you've got a right to defend yourselves. And there just comes a point where you don't want to go to a FEMA camp. You, you, I mean, you'll know. And then it's time to make a decision. Alfred, do you think we're getting closer and closer to uh, decision time? I think so, but the one thing about it is this. When they have to force you, it becomes evidence that they're failing. It's not evidence of that they're gaining strength, but in my opinion, it's evidence that they're becoming increasingly desperate. When the system is working properly, they will fleece you and you will not even notice or complain. When they got to put a gun to your head before you surrender your fleece, it's evidence that they're really losing their fundamental power, which is deception and betraying trust, inspiring trust, and then betraying that trust. When they got to pull out the guns, they're in trouble. And it's yeah, same thing with Nazi Germany and so on. I mean, when they got to start pushing people around with guns, it's a sign that their end is near. But before we get there, we're going to go through purgatory or hell on earth because they will not just roll over and surrender because they think, you know, they're, they may be running out of gas. They're going to they're going to hammer people if they possibly can. Well, they have to whatever. because they're going to be brought to justice when they fail. I mean, yeah. we've got a cornered goblin we're dealing with here. And mm -hmm. I totally agree with you that once the, once the force comes in, that's because they're going into a whole new phase because they're desperate. And, and, and giving in to them isn't, once they start the force, it doesn't end, people. You got to go through this. You know, mm -hmm. it's not fun. It's not happy. Yeah. It's like when your car starts rolling down an embankment. It's not fun, but hold on to the steering wheel and pray to God. You know, we're going through this thing, and that's the end of it. So you might as well batten down the hatches and get your cutlass, and, and I'm talking about cutlass in the info war. The pen is mightier than the sword. Absolutely. The info war is king, and it, who shoots first loses. Do you agree with that, Alfred? Yeah, I'd say that's probably true, and I'll tell you something else I've been telling people lately. I, I absolutely advocate gun ownership, but I also tell people you should own at least as many dictionaries as you own firearms. It's in the words. If you can handle the words, you can handle this system. Exactly. If you can't handle the words, you can't handle a gun. We'll be right back, ladies and gentlemen, because it's the mind that wields the gun. We'll be right back. Alfred Adask is our guest. We're taking your phone calls right now. I'm Alex Jones. This is the GCN Radio Network. We do have the gentleman, one of the people, arrested uh, in lower Manhattan for st staying on the street corner while other people were allowed to stand around and talk as long as they supported the official fable that Keebler elves uh, are garden gnomes out of uh, Southeast Asia or Central Asia or maybe the North Pole carried out 9-11. A big deal to have somebody saying, I've got flyers here, information that was never a proper investigation. Six of the 10 commissioners say it's a fraud. We need a new investigation. Cops, boom. Boy, you're not in America. We're taking you to the gulag. <laughs> Man, it's amazing. Free speech zones to now you don't even stand on a street corner. Uh, cops, do you have any idea that when you enforce tyranny like that, the world you're invoking, what you're doing to yourself, that you're removing your own heads, your own defense? That's the amazing thing about this is, uh, Alfred, 
is that they've got people so unconscious, so unaware, and these cops will follow basically any order in many areas, especially areas like New York, Illinois, California, that we've gotten to this point. What would you say before we go to calls here quickly to, to people out there uh, who serve the system? Uh, because from all my research, the system enjoys abusing its own minions more than anybody else. And why is that in your view? I'm not sure what the answer is for abusing their own minions, but they certainly do it. Anybody who's been close to the Army, I mean, people, Agent Orange in the Vietnam War, you get the, uh, what, Gulf War illness out of the first invasion of Iraq, you get that just problem after problem. These people are routinely abused. They keep coming back. It goes to the idea that the government has an unlimited supply of money, and people are addicted to money The same for the same reason they're addicted to drugs. Again, and the same thing. They're paying these people more money typically than they can make in the private sector, so they're going to hang on to their jobs. They will just follow orders, even if it puts them in jeopardy. And the globalists and are soft the killing the them. The globalists have done actuaries and know going back thousands of years that the military is going to have skills once they've gotten out, but are going to be older and wiser, and they don't <laughs> want a force of healthy people that are aware, so they're all given soft kill degenerative or fatal diseases. And we know that from the thousands of programs like Project Shad, where they murdered thousands and thousands of U.S. troops under secret programs. Of course, that's to kill them uh, and to test the weapons, but also to test the scientists to then recruit other scientists to build large armies of people who enjoy killing troops for many different reasons and who will follow orders, but soon they won't need that giant killer scientist core that is at the very top of the New World Order servant class, right below the top families. It's all killer scientists, all bloodthirsty psycho scientists with high IQs. But 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 in the future, the globalists are shifting to a technocracy where everything is robotic and drone, and then they won't even need those scientists and technocrats anymore. That's why they're pushing for the self-aware computer. You know, one of the things, insofar as this is all done with money, and it's people's addiction to money that lies at the heart of this thing. I mean, you can pay the people, they're going to just follow orders. They, what, they don't know what's going on. They know payday is on the 1st and the 15th, and that's all they need to know. The reason government can be so free with this money is because they can spin it out of thin air. They use fiat currency. If you wanted to restore a government that was responsible to the people, one of the first things you'd do is get back to a gold and silver-based currency. Because now the magicians can't. Can... out of thin air. Exactly. Now the magicians, again, they get the whole <laughs> world out of a lie people will kill for a hundred dollars and it's all just made up crud and women i mean even educated women they see a suitcase of money they just literally fall to their knees most of them fast cars houses it's all crud and these people will fall to their knees for a lie when they could stare out at the sun the stars creation and and actually see the true wealth all around them yeah, it's a terrible situation, and it involves values, all right? It's a situation be, we do that because we are no longer in a nation, per se. They are encouraging to think in terms of being in an economy. In an economy, you have a completely different system of values than you do in a nation. In a nation composed of people, you have values that are conducive to being people. All right, being men and women in an economy, it's all about the money. Nothing matters. And that's if Rand that Corporation. Money, Grand sure. Corporation said 60 years ago, we're going to get it away from men being strong and standing up for liberty. We're going to make it all just about money. We control that, and yeah. we can do whatever we want by increments. That's exactly right. And they have literally destroyed so much. Uh, but, but again, ideas are bulletproof. They're transcendent. They can be buried, but they can never be killed if we can simply spread this information. 99.9%, mm -hmm. .9%, literally, 99.9% of the 7 billion people on this planet, even if you think you're serving the system, you're being destroyed by it. Why not break the trance? Why not yep. join humanity? Why not yep. come in for the big win? That's exactly right. <laughs> I, I mean, the majority of people, I think the majority of people agree with what we're talking about right now, although they don't want to make the effort to understand it. All right. It takes it takes hard work to understand these ideas. They don't just come to you. Well, more than that, more than that, the subconscious, as you know, Alfred, is probably a thousand times more powerful than the conscious. 
it's the true brain, but the focus is the cerebral cortex. Mm -hmm. And and uh, the, the subconscious is primitive, though, and it makes a split-second decision. These globalists are scary. If I face up to the fact that they're evil, I'll know that I've got to resist them. So I'm going to lie to myself and basically just run away from this. You know, this goes to the concept of consent, in my opinion. It goes back to a spiritual concept. If Satan is real and Satan is looking for your soul, he can't get it by coming up and just putting a gun to your head and killing you. He needs you to consent to sin. He needs you to essentially abandon your own opportunity for salvation by consenting to follow him. He can't just He needs you, you to sell the birthright for the bowl of soup. That's exactly right. And then you be held. That, in my opinion, is at bottom why they really want your consent. They're not playing for your money because they can print all they want in the house and the land. And Revelation the says that that the that the dark ma uh, magicians that serve the beast traffic in men's souls, yeah. and that's what TV and it all about. They want to program you. They want your mind. They want you. They are va they don't care about the money. They control that. They do want your psyche. For all you atheists out there, you can't deny it. They want that psyche yeah. because these people are psychic vampires, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. These people are vampires. They, they are vampires. To... They're not sucking blood down the street. They do that at some of their rituals to stylize it. They want the energy. I'd say they want your soul. Yeah. They want you to surrender your soul. We're saying the same thing in a couple of different ways right now, but they can print all the money they want. That's not the issue. Um, the the issue is they want they're playing for something else, and in my opinion, you know, you some people would object, of course, and they they find it silly. But I think this is spiritual warfare. Everything I've seen, and I didn't come to this as a holy roller. I started studying the law, and the most remarkable thing about that study is it brought me back to the good Lord. I mean, it was not something I was looking for. It wasn't something I was hungry for. It was something that it drives you back, and you begin to see, oh my God. I begin to get this stuff. This is spiritual warfare that's been going on for thousands of years. Well, you're right. And and again, the devil, the spirit of the world, the 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 the, the god of this world mm -hmm. creates all these fake counterfeits so that when yep. you go to a church, it's 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 not it's not the, <laughs> it, and so you think, "Well, this isn't God." Yeah. Yeah. I understand. I went to a 503C church uh I don't know, for about four or five weeks, um, last month or two, and I just couldn't stand it. I just couldn't stand it. I, I had previously been attending a Bible study class. Well, you should somebody, be the preacher. Look, they got these seminaries, and they pick these little weak men and women yeah. to just get up there, and it, that's why this country's gone to hell in a handbasket. I understand. We don't have real clergy in this country. I don't know where they are. There's not many of them. No. It was the clergy no. that led 1776. That's exactly right, and in part because they did not get a tax break out of the government. When you take that 501c3 church designation, part of the deal is you don't spend more than 5% of your resources on political action. No, you're right. Let's the take another call. profits, they're all over the government. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Mitch in Minnesota, thanks for holding. Hey, Alex, how's it going? Good, go ahead. Uh, first things first, I just wanted to personally thank you for leading the crusade against the scum of this earth. Pretty awesome. Really inspiring. And I just wanted to ask what else I could be doing to wake people up to what's going on. I mean, I give them the website, I show them the videos, and they either are just totally resistant to the thought or they just say they can't do anything about it, so they don't Well, care. you have to teach them they have power. Because, yes, even people that are awake feel like they have no power. Uh, I would go find an access TV facility, even if it's 50 miles away, jump through the hoops, get get my videos and other videos on air. I would start a local newsletter that you even hand deliver to maybe 100 homes to start. Uh, I would uh, be a leader yourself and don't ever expect that you are going to fix everything overnight. Just realize that resistance is victory and that it is the it is the. Pouring yourself into something that gives it power. It is the commitment. And it, it again, uh, the, the teacher appears when the student is ready. We need people who are students, because I'm a student, who are also teachers. And go to events. Go to city council. Speak about things. And, and, and you will see the good come after you to help you, and the evil will come. You know, all these people in denial, I challenge them to get politically involved. 
and they will run smack dab into criminals everywhere. And you need to experience the criminals because it's the criminals persecuting you that will give you the power. Uh, uh, Mr. Radaski, one more segment with us. I'm going to take a few more calls. Then we've got our guests popping in, and I've got a bunch of news I want to get to as well. But Alfred Adask is our guest. GCNlive.com is the website, and Alfred's uh, website is Adask, A-D-A-S-K, at dot .wordpress.com. Great guy. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Fundamentally screwed up. There's got to be something wrong with you. If you don't know the world is in deep trouble and retrograding into an even worse position, and if you don't know history and know how dangerous government and elites are and how much danger we're all in, if you don't have chills running up and down your spine, I mean, I talk about my sixth sense years ago would only go off a few times a year. It's going off every five minutes now. I mean, the big things are already happening, as you've noticed, and the world's just going to get crazier. And uh, uh, Alfred Adask... Uh, I mean, do you feel it intellectually, but also in your gut? Oh uh, yeah. I mean, it's you. You can just feel this all around, and I'm and you and I aren't alone. There's people that are going about their lives. They seem to be normal. They don't seem. They're aware. I mean, the hair on the back of their neck is starting to stand up too. They don't know what to do about it, other than just go to work, get some money, and uh, try to pay the gross, pay the rent for the groceries and the rest of that. But. The knowledge, the sense, the anxiety, it's building, the anger. Uh, we, we're not a minority by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, it's, you just can't get people. You know, one of the things I saw years ago at our meetings, we had meetings for Citizens for Legal Reform in Dallas, and I learned that if a speaker made an important point, it was up on the stage, I'd be in the back of the room. The people would just sit there. And they wouldn't make a move. They wouldn't say anything. And if I would clap my hands and then just keep clapping my they would then, then, if someone will stand up and speak, then other people will stand up and speak also. But people are scared to death about being the first one to stand up and speak out. It's important that all of us learn to speak out. You will be astonished to learn how many people. You start clapping your hands, you'll find other people clapping their hands too. You will learn that you're not alone. Well, that's right. One person who's morally right is not a minority, you're a majority. And it's all those famous historical examples of somebody says, who's with me to face down this enemy that's coming down the road in one hour? And first, nobody stands up. And, and, and then finally, one person steps across the line and then more and then everybody steps across yeah. or one or two cowards run out the back. Yeah. And, and it, it, you've, it's called hitting the barbed wire. Yeah. We who you know, that caller was asking what solutions hit the barbed wire, yeah. hit the barbed wire, folks. It's all about hitting the barbed wire. And don't be afraid that you're alone. You're not. Everyone thinks they're alone because they don't see anyone else hitting a wire. You hit the wire and you'll be surprised how many other people. It'll take a moment. They don't just move in lockstep. But as each of us steps up, more of us. And in my experience, the globalists almost have twisted ideas. When, they, when the globalists tear one of us apart or even kill one of us or destroy us, it doesn't really intimidate people in, on, on average. It actually enrages people. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's what Thomas Jefferson said, the blood of tyrants and patriots. Mm -hmm. I, mean, they, I mean, this is not this is for all the marbles. These people come to kill, steal and destroy. It, and people say, oh, you're doing such a great job, Alex or Alfred, fighting them. Oh, you're so I'm not wonderful. I mean, I'm just aware of this. Once you're aware of this, the only action there is is to stand up, right? That's exactly right. Once you begin to see the injustice, it's like you used to live where the world was shades of gray. All of a sudden, something happens and you begin to see in color and you see the bright red color of injustice. And when you do, you can never miss it again. You start to see it. It was before just a shade of gray. You didn't pay any attention. Once you begin to see, you can't turn it off. You're in. Well, I know I've never been more alive than I am now. Yep. Uh, yep. And we're going to win this thing, my friend. We don't have a choice. What do you think about folks that spin the Bible and say it's the end of the world, lay down to evil, don't be involved, we're all going to be raptured? My Bible tells me those who stand firm to the end shall be saved. 
It means my obligation is to stand firm to the end, and that does not mean roll over. It means do what's right, even if it's not going to succeed. Even if you tell me they're going to shoot me tomorrow, I'm still, my obligation is to stand firm to the end. And that means stand firm for righteousness. Now, I don't, you know, I got a lot to learn about that, but still, that's what resonates with me. Well, yeah, I saw stand a quote the, the other day, and I think I've said it myself just organically in different ways, but it was from a, a concentration camp advisor, uh, a, a survivor, and, and they said, there are some forms of victory, you know, when you persevere, that even though you lose, mm. you win. That's exactly right. I mean, winning in this modern world is really failure. Yeah. I mean, I going along, being accepted by the system. If you're being accepted by the system, something's <laughs> wrong. <laughs> Where did you go wrong? <laughs> Alfred Adask, is that the best website? Adask.wordpress.com. Yeah, that's it. That's the only one right now. Well, I'll say this here and now, uh, because if I forget and for some reason don't have you back on for six weeks or something, I want to have you on the TV show next week because uh, your Skype's the best I've seen, your connection. Mm -hmm. And I want you to be a frequent guest here on the show, and then I'd like you to host the show yourself sometime. God be bless glad. you, my friend. Be glad to do it. Thank you, Alex. You bet. We'll be right back. Stay with us. We got one of the people arrested at Ground Zero. One of the biggest things you can do in the info war is visit the online video bookstore apparel area and buy ball caps t-shirts videos because the ball caps the t-shirts get the word out about the websites about ideas of liberty people will ask what does the answer to 1984 is 1776 mean or they'll watch a film like Obama Deception or Endgame or Fall of the Republic or they'll see your new with hunting season coming up orange Infowars.com baseball cap with the Don't Tread on Me snake and the Infowars website. People ask, what is that? Or you'll meet like minded people. The best thing is meeting like minded people and then having meetings and then organizing actions that you're going to be involved in and making it fun. It's exciting. And then starting your own web TV shows. Uh, very easy to do. Start your own local radio show. And don't have this idea that activists are supposed to be failures and, uh, you know, talk from a ditch somewhere with no money. Go get time on a local radio station. Get sponsors. Try to capitalize so that you can buy more airtime and then do a good enough job to be offered a radio show where you get paid. Then put that money into a news website. Again, the globalists control the issuance of currency and credit. But if we can just amass a little bit of funds and then use that to build to the next level and then amass funds and build to the next level, we have to build our own media platforms. The truth is popular. Freedom is popular. And once you do that, now more people will join you. And people will, the general public will respect an organization or group that has an organization. And then the globalists can't pick us all off. That's another thing. They've tried to shut down We Are Change. What's We Are Change? Luke Radowski got kicked out of 9-11 We Are Truth, 9-11, uh, one of the truth groups in New York, because he was going after the New World Order and making it political, not just about George Bush, but making it about the full spectrum. And he was getting a lot of people to join, very successful. They kicked him out. I had him on air, and I didn't attack the other group. I just said, Luke's a real leader. Folks should join it. And he says, I'm calling it We Are Change. And it's because it has no leadership other than action that no one can really infiltrate it or take it down because you can infiltrate or take over one chapter. But then in the same town, a new one that's real because ideas are bulletproof pops back up because it's leaderless resistance. It's led by ideas, a shared culture of freedom. That's what info warriors are doing. That's why we can't be stopped. You can't infiltrate. You can't kill Alex Jones because if you kill me, it would just energize the movement that much more. I'm just flesh and blood, but ideas, ideas are bulletproof. And when you realize that and you understand that when you've got the truth, it trumps everything else, it's game over. But people have to believe they can win. People have to believe they have power. People have to see how far we've come. Now, again, we've got this new ball cap in. It's orange, and I think it's almost as good or in a way even better than the camouflage one. And it's available right now at Infowars.com. So I hope you'll get a bunch of these orange caps and get them out to people. It really, really turns heads. While you're at it, get Invisible Empire and other great documentary films uh, that we produced and put out. Okay, and, I, and I'm going to get to 
Ken and Bill and Arnold and Michael and Adam. I promise I'll at least get to those calls. I meant to read some passages from 1984. I've been trying to do this for a week. Uh, but I take you to uh, Scott Hoffman, uh, who is the gentleman. Uh, and we have this video posted yesterday at Infowars.com. It's now scrolled into the uh, uh, featured news archive of him being arrested for simply speaking on a street corner. They have the streets blocked off. He's there just speaking and handing out flyers. What a scary, tyrannical uh, image. Uh, sir, tell us what happened to you. Alex, uh, what, a, what an honor to meet you. It's, it's fantastic to be on your show. Um, yeah, what happened to me is that, uh, you know, the 9-11 uh, propaganda event was over. And, you know, I was just so disgusted with how, how all of these poor, suffering families and, and are being exploited by this, by this propaganda event. And they're, you know, subliminally and even overtly, they're just taking all of our pain and anguish and channeling it into this one point of hatred, hatred for Muslims and hatred for, for these, these other terrorists that are always out there. You know, my point is, what about the terrorists that are right inside of our country? And what about the fact that the, that the World Trade Centers were taken down a controlled demolition? Doesn't that factor into the investigation at some point? How long are we going to wait around for an investigation, you know, of this? This, this is obvious. Well, Scott, Scott, I want to go over that with you. But I want to give you the floor, so I'm not going to interrupt here for about four or five minutes. And we're going to be rolling the video. It's got some profanity in the background with some of the crowd, so we can't play the audio. But people can watch it at InfoWars.com, but for AM and FM with FCC rules, we can't air the cuss words, even though they're low in the background. I'm going to be rolling the video while you speak about what happened to you. You've got the floor. Okay. You know, I was there, and the event ended. And my man, my man Greg Lance, who just was another fellow 9-11 truther, happened to show up in the same spot at the same time. I didn't even know him. Uh, we met. I saw him. He had a, he had a shirt on, said 9-11 truth now. So I said, hey, this is the right guy to hand, pass my camera off to get a record of this because I'm going to try to reach some people down here at Ground Zero where, you know, the, you know all the 9-11 truthers, that were there to protest together were barricaded off about four or five blocks away. I mean, it was a complete police state in action at Ground Zero. The, and, you know, we were surrounded on four sides by barricade. We were barricaded in about maybe 3,000 people across the street on Church Street going north were barricaded in. And behind them, there was another 3,000 people barricaded in. And all the, you know, four sides of these, of these blocks were, were, were just like walkways for guys with machine guns, uh, police, white shirts. There were even these guys with these, you know, with those little uh, CIA uh, earpieces in with the little curly cord going back into their, 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 uh, you know, their shirt. And, and I was like, what is going on here? This is such a crackdown. And, and nobody's, it, it's just a peaceful crowd of people that come there to mourn for 9-11, you know? And then Paul Simon got up there and sang his song. And I was like, I was looking at the screen. It said he was supposed to sing Bridge Over Troubled Water, and he decided to sing The Sound of Silence. And I was listening to the words. I said, well, there's one of us right up there in the middle of that, of that event. Thank God for that. Because if you listen to the words of that song, you know, the words of the prophet are written on the subway wall and in the tenement halls. That's the 9-11 truth movement. That's us. We're in the tenement halls, and we're on the subway wall, and YouTube is the subway wall of, uh, 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 of this society right now. And that's where the truth is being spoken. So when that event ended and the screen went to, you know, blue, and, and I realized, that's it. It's done. The crowd is dispersing. Now I can talk because I'm not interrupting this event. I started talking in a loud voice, and I said, when are we going to be allowed to know the truth about 9-11? And I had this paper uh, by Neil Harrett, by Neil, Neil, Neil Harrett, I think that's, that's, I got the name right, uh, about thermitic uh, explosives found in the dust of the World Trade Center. You know, I was a little bit nervous when I started talking, so I might have gotten the title wrong. I mean, it's not easy, you know, just starting to speak out openly in a crowd that big where there's virtually nobody there to stand with me. But you know what? I said... It, I, there probably are a lot of people here 
that know the truth about 9-11. And that's, that, that's where my faith is, is that New York City knows the truth. You know, I've been out there talking about 9-11 truth for years, and what I find is that pretty much everybody knows by now. Pretty much everybody. There's only certain people who have a certain conflict of interest in their daily life, which, does, which, which keeps them from either looking at the evidence or keeps them from embracing it, you know, if they do look at it. Like my father, who's an engineer, and he was in the World Trade Center when that plane hit. He was in Tower 2. He almost died that day, and he was able to escape. He ran through the rubble, you know, had to climb over bodies. He had to carry a body down the staircase on his way out. We couldn't find him all day. And, you know, and he's traumatized from that, you know. And so I have a reason to be there, too. And, you know, this guy walks up to me, the guy that's, like, shouting the profanities, uh, by the way, um, and, and being aggressive and being violent and, you know, being, like, super confrontational. And he told me that I wasn't welcome there. Well, you know what? Freedom of speech is a constitutional right. I don't need to be welcomed there by you or anybody else. I have a right to be there. And the fact that the majority of people in that crowd, I can guarantee you, are aware of 9-11 truth and want to hear it. And we're actually stopping and listening, like, peaceably. If you look at the video carefully, you can see that some people are slowing down. One woman is shushing me, and this other guy starts, like, like you know, exploding in, in, in rage. And these people me. are clearly... Totally ignorant about liberty, totally ignorant about freedom, Scott. And, uh, you know, watching the video of you uh, be drug away by the police, if anybody should have been arrested for disorderly conduct, it's the guy that's starting a fight with you and cussing and aggressive and in your face. And he still shouldn't have right. been arrested. He should have just been pushed back. And the cops right. took you to jail. Now, now tell us, after you're put in the police car, after you're, into it, huh? after you're put in the police car, though, uh, what did the police say anything to you? Did you tell them shame on you, disgracing your oath of office? Well, no, I didn't. You know why? Because uh, the New York City Police Department is also very aware of 9-11 truth. It took me about an hour to get to a police car. They kept me there. Uh, you, you only see little, like, bits and pieces of the video. But I was standing out there in the middle of a barricaded street. Uh, for at least a half an hour, and during that entire time, I never stopped talking to this this crowd of police officers that are, were, were around. Good. Me. And surprisingly, uh, I mean, it would be I think it's surprising to a lot of people. It wasn't surprising to me because I've been doing this for a while. The police officers wanted to know more. They were actually asking me for the websites to look up to find no, out. No, I know. I've had police and firemen and masks come over and say, "We know, we know." The question is, then, why did they arrest you? Why did they well, follow that I was order? Never given a reason. They never. I asked them that many times on the way to the police car. I asked them that on, you know, when they first accosted me. I said, "Why are you doing this? You can't hear it on the video." I said, "Why am I being arrested?" And they didn't say anything. They just grabbed me and dragged me out. And and, and then another guy shouted from the crowd, Greg, who was filming. He said, "Why are you? Why is it being arrested?" And and then I turned around again and said, "Yeah, why am I being arrested?" And they. They just never, they just, they basically they told me to shut up a couple of times. They said, they said, they, later on, about five minutes later, after I was put in the police car, I asked, so why exactly is it that I'm being arrested? And this guy, the, I think it was the rookie who said, he said, because you resisted. And I'm like, well, you know, resisted what? Resisted arrest? What am I being arrested for? I have a right to resist being bullied around by police officers. You have a I right think? to continue to speak on a street corner in America. I mean, it's so fundamental. And the fact that all over the country now, they arrest you. I mean, that, that, that's always been Americana, whether it's an old crazy guy saying the end is near, uh, or whether yeah. it's, 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 it's somebody, you know, they're, uh, you know, advertising that there's a pizza shop down the road. This fundamental right is under right. assault. Uh, have they charged you with anything? They charged me in the end. They finally charged me with disorderly conduct. Yeah. Can I just add something? You know, the KKK is a known terrorist organization, and they march in America. They have the right to speak whenever they want to, and this is, a, this is insane. By the way, that's a good point. I noticed that 
they let that group go to funerals and 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 scream right. at the families. But then I'm seeing more and more examples of where like mainline reasonable groups are being arrested. And so it's almost like they let the really wild people speak to make First Amendment look bad and then go after everybody else. Right. And, um, oh, God, I lost my point. What was I going to say? Um, KKK. Well, no, not exactly the KKK. I kind of lost my train of thought there. You were right? saying um, they let a known terrorist group uh, march in America because it's their First Amendment, but... Well, I mean, it's just that I wasn't saying anything inflammatory. That's the point. That's the. That's but the even if you point. were, it's free speech. I mean, we're getting yeah. into this mode of anything that hurts somebody's feelings you can't say in America. Oh, right. I remember what I wanted to say. They use this rubric of respecting the families as a way to create a shroud of silence that you're not supposed to break at ground zero during 9-11. Okay? If you speak about anything except what they have authorized, then you are disrespecting the families of 9-11. Well, you know what? I think that we're respecting the families when we demand to know the truth about who killed these people. That's well, that's right. Know. Look, look, look. Look at how they wrap themselves in the first responders' heroism. But because so many of them are mad about the dust and the inside job, they're not welcome at Ground Zero. I mean, yeah. look, they're scared. That's why there was so much security this year. That's why they blocked people back for miles, because they know we know. And they're desperate right. to resurrect right. the myth of 9-11 to use it again, Scott. That's right. I think they're afraid of a massive uprising in New York. And, and I was probably the person that they feared most at that point, a person who was among the masses. I was not barricaded off. You know, screaming like a like a like a lunatic. You know, where they've got you. You know, basically in a in a in a in a pen, a cage, and you you really look like a lunatic when you're inside of a cage protesting. So I say to the 9/11 truthers, get out of the cage, get among the masses again, get in places where you're not supposed to be, and start talking about it. Now, Luke Radowski, he confronted Larry Silverstein on 9/11, and I got to take my hat off to that guy. He is he's got some cojones, you know. I don't Luke's know. done it over and over and over and over again. The guy that says he blew up Building Seven. Uh, uh, tell us about this latest one. What, what do you mean? Tell you about what? The latest Silverstein confrontation. Well, he he. It's on YouTube. He asked Larry Silverstein about some of the details of his statements, uh, such as the one where he gave the order to pull it, and Larry Silverstein was just ridiculously evasive. Well, he just confronted him like a week ago. You mean he's done it again? What, was that a week ago? I thought it was today. I, I thought it was on No, no it might have been. He's confronting him all the time. By the way, Luke, you know, his family gets death threats, too. Luke's got a lot of courage. Have you seen yeah. the footage of the cops and the, and, the, and the goons coming over and saying his camera's a gun and we're going to put you in yeah. jail for terrorism? Yeah, yeah, we're going we're gonna to lock you up. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Guess who's going to jail? Right, right, right. You may, I know you're not a terrorist, but you're going to be in the hole for 30 days, eh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really proud to be an American when I got people like that in this country. Well, you need to it. obviously fight this. Uh, where's the best website for folks to visit uh, or for people to get in contact with you or lawyers or whatever? I think you should sue them for false imprisonment, violation of your constitutional rights, civil right violation. Well, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to risk. I mean, can I give out my email? Because I don't really have a website. Yeah, yeah, give it out. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll say the website to get in touch with is We Are Changed New York City. Okay, that's the main website. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a sort of you know uh, weekend warrior with those. No, guys. I understand. It's just it's just that Luke says that site's been having problems. Stay there. We'll briefly try to give people your contact. Then I'll take a few phone calls. Stay Scott with us. Hoffman was just pointing out to me the police should have been there protecting his First Amendment, not arresting him. And uh, the state of Texas has tried to arrest people for peacefully speaking and has lost a lot of lawsuits. New York has lost thousands over this and uses taxpayer money to pay them. This paid tens of millions last time I checked just from the RNC. They don't care. Uh, they're really, I mean, Bloomberg is a monster. Uh, I mean, this is like something out of China. So where's Amnesty International? This is wrong. Now, you guys are having a flash mob uh, of a media personality who's always out there whitewashing. Uh, I think it's better to uh, announce where you're going to be and let the cops be there in mass and let it be a big circus. That's how you're going to get attention. 
but if you don't want to tell people who the target of your First Amendment information warfare is, that's fine. Uh, it's your choice, Scott, but give people the corner and where, where you're meeting in two days. Okay, we're going to have basically a flash mob to confront a, uh, it's going to be a peaceful confrontation with a high-level mainstream media operative who is always whitewashing 9-11, but who has, uh, who has on the record admitted that 9-11 does need to be reinvestigated. Uh, and we're going to meet at the corner of West 27th and 10th Avenue at between 6.30 a.m. and 7 a.m. That's the gathering time. It's right at the front of Chelsea Park on the corner of West 27th and 10th. Uh, we Are Change is, is going to be a part of this, and I encourage all 9-11 truthers, whether you've been at ground zero or not, if you believe in the truth, to be there, because this is going to be a peaceful confrontation, and we're going to demand that this journalist uh, live up to their ex Yeah, well, what this whitewasher does is when she doesn't think there's any viewers, she'll say, yeah, Building seven's suspicious because she was there when it blew up and ran away. I told her to get back. She's an eyewitness to it. Uh, it's on wow. tape. Uh, and but, but when she's on her own show, it's like, Noam Chomsky, tell me how Al-Qaeda is real. <laughs> okay. Hey, listen, we'll talk to you soon. Uh, God Thank bless you. you. And also the great guy that shot the video to document it, uh, Scott Hoffman. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, yeah, that was Greg Lance. Thanks. Thanks to everybody for being there. All right. Thank you, brother. God bless you, man. Wonderful, wonderful news. Uh, I think he was saying, oh, uh, Greg Lance, he's from We Are Change. Where'd you say? Carolina. Carolina. So people should check that out. Thank you so much. All right. I want to jam in some calls here. I'll be back tonight. We've got some really big reports with a lot of work on Internet censorship and kill switches and control. Government drug dealing tonight with some new developments. Uh, solar flare dangers, even the government says the biggest ever recorded are coming this way and have already knocked out power in major U.S. cities in the last week, but it's just been a minor footnote. We want to worry about something real. It ain't Al-Qaeda, folks. It's, 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 <laughs> it's Mother Nature. Uh, Ken in Texas, been holding for a while. Go ahead, Ken. You're our tail gunner in the official radio show. <laughs> Great show today, Alex. I appreciate you letting me on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just, you know, Alfred was talking about books that everybody should have, regardless of your religious affiliation. The one book that you should have is Black's Law Dictionary. Yes. Because that's the only way you're going to figure it out. Um, uh, it was used for state and national propaganda. And had my picture. Your phone's breaking up, sir. You said something about state propaganda. I think somebody's calling you. Try that. Is that better? Yeah, go ahead, sir. I was used for state and national propaganda. I had my picture taken with Dr. Jonas Salk. Uh, my dad was a part of the industrial military complex and then got out. Um, Run-ins with the alphabet agencies, and they basically scared the hell out of me. Stay there. I want to come back to you. This sounds riveting. Internet only. Infowars.com. TV coming up. We're talking to Ken in Texas, weren't we? Yeah, and he was saying, uh, yeah, Dr. Salk, the loving polio vaccine guy. Um, one of his big associates on CBC TV admitted, yeah, we put the cancer viruses in there. <laughs> yeah, it killed 100 million people. Big deal. Uh, but you were talking about um, your family got out of this, and then you got threatened. Go ahead. Well, I, my dad gave me the red pill at eight. I mean, he told me everything that was going to happen. And, you know, so you fight it, and then they come after you, and you go and you hide. And you have that fear. And I got sick of it said no more and so I went to work for the globalists and I went to work for a very high level one and I learned how to double trip on quadruple businesses I don't care if they're at 500,000 or a billion dollars in sales and I learned the strategies and the problem and I'm, I'm going to give some constructive criticism here is most people that listen to you hear what you say, they understand it intellectually, they agree with you, they know it's the right thing to do, and then they do nothing. Why? Because I'm not probably giving them easy ways to do things because I know that if I just said do this simple thing, it actually wouldn't be a solution. It'd be a solution to make this show bigger. But, but I want people to think on their own and come up with different ideas to attack in different directions and out of that, it'll be an attack pattern that the globalists can't stop. 
No, I understand that. But knowledge is not power. Action knowledge is power. Acted upon, knowledge acted upon is power. Yes. And the problem is you say we're in an info war, and it's not true. We're in a psychological war. This is psych ops. Okay, this is power of influence, and 99% of our side is tactical. And if being strategic, I will slaughter you every single time because I'm five steps ahead. And the passion on our side is compelling. Our persuasion sucks. Yeah. Well, I don't ever think of myself as having all the answers. And, and you know, it's more than that. I tell people who think they're working for the dark side and winning that they're not winning. And so hopefully people will see that and think about it, not because I told them that. They already knew that. I'm just reminding people like a door chime. Hey, the door just got opened. and You can get out of this. This is not a good place everybody's going here, acting off of manipulation and deception. We've got two minutes left. Tell us what we should do then. Ideas from your experience that have been effective. Well, I know that you have the research. We have to come up with a way to package it properly so that we can open more eyes. Because we don't have time. We don't have 20 more years for everybody to wait around and all of a sudden the, the light bell goes off. And they, all they do is reframe everything. And it's time for us to take our own psychological operations and put the information so that people can see it sooner so that instead of, you know, we quadruple your organization and then get people mobilized because they can see it and then they can articulate it, not necessarily in an argumentative mode, so that more people will receive it. Yeah, I've talked to a lot of people and they say if you craft things or whatever, I understand the globalists and they just flip names, repackage falsely. I mean, m my mission is just to get people to realize there's manipulation going on and to look at it for themselves. Uh, and I think we've been some of the most successful people out there uh, overall. So, I mean, I, I don't think there's, you know, silver bullets. I think it's easier for, you know, the, uh, the, the power structure to do big things because it has the unlimited false capital. So to, don't ever underestimate that. No, not at all. But with what you've got repackaged with a cup, you know, one word turns a campaign from being a failure into a massive success. Okay, but I mean, what word? Survival of the human species? No, no, no. Hope no, change? I mean, it's something that, it's something, but I'm, I'm telling you, now's the time. And I'd, be, I'd be willing to help. I'll have John Harmon uh, give you one of our emails. Send me some of your ideas with your email. Send it right now.